All right. Here we are. Another Tech Enthusiasm live stream. Second one, kind of short notice, going solo. Hope we get some turnout. I know we're up against a couple of things tonight, World Series and so on. But it was definitely a busy home theater weekend. And uh, there will be content coming about all of the theaters I saw around Michigan this past weekend, um, dedicated video content and everything. But I wanted to open up the floor a little bit tonight. Um, I was with Youth Man the other weekend as well. And I, I saw there were, there were some comments, some questions that came through um, there that uh, we didn't get to all of them. And I think some of them were directed towards me about a few things, Kaleidoscape and others. So we'll give it a few minutes here and kind of see what the turnout is. Um, for those that are here, feel free to shout out. Let me know you're here, where you're from, et cetera. Bear with me a little bit tonight as well. Last time I did the live stream, I just used the built-in YouTube stuff and it was pretty straightforward. I am trying out StreamYard tonight. So my first time using software, using this, this service, this software live. Always asking for trouble using new things in a live setting uh, for the first time, but we'll see how it goes. All right, so we got a few folks. I'm trying to check the comments here. Got my first. There we go. So try some comments again, if you would. I think the, the StreamYard wasn't showing them. I had to do a flip of the public to private settings there. And hopefully I don't have to jump back and forth to YouTube itself to see comments. There we go. I think it's, I think there's a lag actually. Um, another thing to get used to with StreamYard, 10 second or so lag. Awesome. So we got it. Got a, a number of folks here. Got some comments coming through. Nas, Oprah. Hi, Oprah. Decibel Destroyer. Darius Grant. Love the channel. Thanks so much. Hello, hello. Good evening. Give it another minute or so collect some folks um, so I can see them. If you have questions, uh, please go ahead and post in the comments. I will try to answer any and all questions that come through. We're starting here just a few minutes after the top of the hour at eight o'clock. I've got some time, so I'm, I'm happy to hang out as long as we've got folks. We've got something to talk about and there's questions and comments and topics coming in. Um, I'll stick around for, for a good while here tonight. Talk a little bit about the home theater tours the home theaters that I was able to experience this past weekend, the, the get togethers in the Southeast-ish Michigan area here. Talk a little bit about some uh, things that are happening or will be happening with the channel. Um, some new stuff that I found I'm eager to get my hands on. So all that and more, plus again, any questions and what that come in. I appreciate folks coming out up to 16. That's awesome. Um, so, uh, please do post. And if you feel so inclined, ask questions and, and whatnot. There are super chats and all of that available to use. So I just want to say thanks for coming out. Thanks for those that, you know, that enjoy the channel's content. This has been an awesome process, basically uh, setting this whole thing up, um, getting involved with the home theater 
industry, community, and all of it this way. It's been super, super uh, just really rewarding. So coming up on the end of the year, I was hoping maybe that we'd hit 5,000 subs by the end of the year. I think now, actually, I, uh, there's a good chance of kind of crushing right through that. So super excited, um, super excited about that. Maybe even hit 5,500, 6,000 subs and got a big 2023 planned for, for the channel. All right, well, let's take a look at some questions. We've got some questions rolling in right off the top. Nas is asking, uh, you think an Apple TV would be good for an Android user? Use a Shield Pro, but returned it because of audio sync issues. Yeah, um, I think it would be fine for an Android user, honestly. The only thing that you really wouldn't get is the integrated Apple services. But even if you take, if you're not an iCloud user, if you're not an Apple, uh, you don't keep your photos there, you don't subscribe to Apple Music, um, don't buy your shows on iTunes and whatnot. To me, I, I think the Apple TV still reigns supreme as one of the best streamer boxes out there. Um, Apple gets, I think, the best versions of the apps, the, the most developed versions of the apps from third-party companies. Um, if you look back when things like Disney Plus went live and HBO Max and so on, right? Apple TV is kind of the pilot. It's the first one to get get those apps. So overall, I think it's it's you know one of the best um, best supported boxes out there. So even if you don't use the Apple services, it's really great in that regard. It's not perfect. It has its shortcomings. There's some things that the Roku does that I really wish the Apple TV would do, like better control for integration and things like that. There's stuff the Shield does I wish the Apple TV would do, like being able to bitstream out of an app like Plex or Infuse for that lossless Atmos audio uh, and so on. But yeah, I don't think you, I don't think you have to be an Apple full ecosystem stalwart to make use of certain Apple devices um, in your life. I think the iPad is still the, like the best tablet. Um, so, you know. So 876 Oprah Winfrey asked with K, can you tell any difference between the picture quality versus 4K HDR picture? I'm assuming by 4K HDR picture, you're talking about discs, Kaleidoscape versus physical media. Um, so of, amongst all the reasons to buy a Kaleidoscape, the, the picture quality delta, I think, isn't really one of the main ones. I think really it needs to be a decision predicated more on do you value the, the accessibility components of it, right? The early access to content, not having to mess around getting disks, waiting for disks, managing disks, or, or if you're doing the server thing, taking the extra time to rip them. Right, all of that stuff. K eliminates all of that from your life essentially, and just makes the prospect of enjoying high fidelity, high bitrate content as effectively seamless and, and easy as you can make it. And they charge for it. It costs a lot of money. Convenience costs a lot of money. Luxury, right, costs a lot of money, and that goes for a number of premium and luxury products inside home theater and outside home theater. Um, so that said, you know, I did do a video a while back where I compared on the order of 40 or 44, I think some odd movies that I had ripped the movie uh, from the 4K disc to a, a main movie, you know, main audio stream only MKV file. And I, I took a look at what was the resulting size, right? Size as a proxy for quality. What was the size of the MKV, the size of the Blu-ray rip relative to the size of the download on Kaleidoscape? And I don't remember the exact number that came out of that comparison, but I want to say it, it was very large, very largely in the favor of Kaleidoscape, where the K download outsized the physical media main movie component by 10%, 15% larger. Um, you know, instead of 60 gigabyte uh, off of a disk, maybe you're looking at something like 70 gigabyte on a K download. And then, of course, you have those outliers like Avengers Endgame, where it's a 100 gigabyte download compared to a BD66 uh, disk. And you know, can you see those differences? I think they're they're going to still be subtle at best. It's more of a peace of mind thing, right? If you know you want to have the highest fidelity content for your super high end premium space, and you've got the money for it, and it doesn't bug you, buy the Kaleidoscape. It's, it's simple. It's easy. Be done with it. Um, but there's nothing wrong with physical media. There's nothing wrong with rips. I I go around in my mind on these things all the time. Like um, you know, K is expensive. Continuing to own and maintain a K. Um, is expenses in and of itself. There's probably going to be a new version of a Strato at some point 
that I would want to buy. That's going to be some thousands of dollars down the road buying content in, in multiple stores, potentially. So you got to weigh, you got to weigh a lot, I guess, in that decision. But picture quality wouldn't be the only motivation factor, I would say. A couple more questions. Ali Pazuka, dude, so we live in Michigan. Let's meet one day. We'd love to see your home theater. Yeah, awesome. So <clears throat> that kind of goes to one of the main topics that I wanted to to chat about tonight, which is basically the meetups. Um, this past weekend, I went to three home theaters here in Southeast Michigan. So going back to last November and essentially through ABS forum, I was able to find and discover the fact that there's like meetup groups all over the place. Um, on ABS specifically, there's different threads for uh, different areas, different states, and there's a pretty lively Michigan Midwest-ish um, home theater excuse me, home theater meetup community. And so I went to my first one, which was a projector shootout at a guy's house uh, up in Flint uh, last year. Uh, we went to his house, I think, a second time. And, and now there's all this um, excitement about uh, guys wanting to get back together, right? Coming out of COVID times and, and doing meetups is kind of back on the table. I have actually had uh, a couple or a handful of folks off of ABS Forum over to my house a few different times. We played played together here um, with the JVC NX7 against the Epson LS12000 projector um, going back and forth in, in AB and m And so um, I, I strongly encourage everybody, if, if you're looking for folks, this is very much kind of a lone wolf hobby. I, if I asked, raise your hand, right? If you're all into this stuff and you might've done a DIY theater and, and you've spent a bunch of money on gear and you're like the only person you know that operates kind of in this hobby at this level, right? Because because that's that's me. I've got friends that have some systems and some minor things, but nobody that kind of is is all into it at, at this level. So finding folks that are getting together with a bunch of them, talking about all this stuff, learning from them, and particularly like going to other people's spaces and just experiencing them, man, it lights up ideas in your mind. Like I, I really like how they did this, or. I, I actually, it, it, you know, I confirmation biases in some way. You, you see some things in one room and you might find, okay, I really like the way I did this in my room. This person did it different for me, the way that I did it. I, you know, I, I like that better. So you, it's just, it's so full of that kind of cross pollinating ideas and, and getting out in the hobby. So, um, you know, Ali, check out ABS forum, do a search for like the Michigan, uh, Michigan GTGs, they call them or the Michigan meetups. Um, there's actually a speaker shootout, I think coming up. I think that one might actually be next weekend um, up in Flint as well. Um, I would plan to do some stuff in the future too. Um, and I think more of the guys are going to be motivated to do it. Uh, you know, more, more and more are coming up is just awesome. And so I'll get in, we'll cover a couple more questions here and then start talk a little bit about the experience of, of the three theaters that I went to last weekend. All right. Uh, Julius. Hey, Julius. Julius is like tech enthusiast number one. Um, awesome to have you here. He's He's been watching the channel, I think, since the, uh, amongst the earliest of the folks that that comment on all the videos and are there every time. Love it. So super, super appreciate it. And he's the one guy I think that might have bought some tech enthusiasm merch. He's got the he's rocking one of the hoodies off the spread shop. Uh, Pat, I see rising black on G2 HDR and Dolby Vision. Um, I haven't noticed any problems with my G2. Um, admittedly, in the last uh, little bit here, I haven't hardly done any type of video-based entertainment. We've just been busy and traveling and, and came back from multiple trips and, and all of that. Um, I have seen the LG update probably almost three times, update firmware, I want to say in the last six-ish weeks, it feels like. Um, and I did see some other channels uh, dropping some videos. It was in my subscription list anyway, questioning some of the HDR performance with the latest firmware on the LG. So yeah, chin to pad. I, I'm not sure, honestly, I need to kind of catch up on the state uh, state of the LG um, and what's been going on with those those latest, those latest firmwares. All Tech Geek says, hey, Jeremy, I wish Apple would have sent you an Apple TV 4K review unit, see your take on it. Well, I bought them. They're coming. So I bought two of them. Um, to me, 150 bucks, no brainer, easy purchase, uh, particularly because I've got a couple of limitations.
that we do use our Apple TVs for gaming. And actually, I do find 64 gigabytes to be a little bit small. So as soon as they they said larger storage, you know, faster processor, more RAM, it's going to run that sneaky Sasquatch, sneaky Sasquatch game so much better. Um, and a couple of the other games that, that we play, my kids play and the family plays as well. So I think they were scheduled to ship. Um, I don't know if they shipped on the 4th or they arrive on the 4th. I ordered them straight up from Apple. So um, I'm trying. I'm really trying to make connections with as many companies as I can and, and get get stuff in. Um, in some cases, I'm, I'm told that the channel is still a little bit too small where we'd like, you know, politely, we'd like to see you grow a little bit more. And that's fine. Um, you know, I get that. There's there are are many much larger home theater channels out there, but we'll get there. Takes another year, year or so. Uh, but there are there are a number of companies that I would want to get on those lists for be able to get those devices because I did see that the I think it was actually today the new 2022 model Apple TV 4K reviews started dropping. So the people that were able to get them uh, as reviewers and, and demo units and whatever um, had them and they were able to put their put their content out today. And I'll come back to the Apple TV a little bit later because I found something truly, truly amazing with the Apple TV that I'm, I'm also trying to work a bit of an angle on. We'll come back to that in a little bit. Uh, Julius asks, what convinced you to be a YouTuber? Um, well, I would say last spring, um, I was actually, I had, I had recently then come off of doing couple other side things like in the a bit engaging with a couple companies ta talking uh, working as a bit like of, of a voice of the customer uh, type of thing and that came to a close and I had some fun doing that um, it was still COVID-ish e times we weren't doing a whole lot you know still at the beginning of, of 2021 and so I had some extra time and I had uh, happened into uh, being able to to edit some video for for actually my day job, um, I had to make some demo like marketing videos for the software products that that I manage, and so I finally got my hands on doing some real legit video editing, um, and figured well let, I want to do something else with this home theater stuff, kind of the building this room and having this stuff opened up the doors to to engage in the industry a little bit before. And I wanted to keep that rolling. I thought about a couple of, of different or, or multiple social media things, like maybe a podcast or, or whatever. And after doing a bunch of research on kind of the different platforms, how they work, what it would take to, to actually do each of them, I kind of settled on YouTube. It seemed like the, uh, seemed like a, the best quote unquote choice from a perspective of like how the content works, how I could make it, what I, what I felt I could do and say on it, the technical aspects of it. The monetization and the, like the business elements, uh, and so um, I'm very happy with the choice I made. I think YouTube was the right one. Definitely had to warm up to a little bit, though. Um, I cringe if I go back and watch some of the videos from last summer. Um, the first ones, they're so stiff and all of that compared compared to now. I, I, I this channel has developed me in so many ways. I, I can talk, engage people freely. The introvert is broken down a little bit and all that. So yeah, that's I guess some history behind the, behind the channel there. Um, All Tech Geek, I'm glad he did. His knowledge of home theater inspiring many to get into the hobby. Dodd Devastator 24 says, how's the AVM 70 treated you? I love it. I, I think that AVM 70 is like absolutely one of the best buys in terms of a processor across home theater right now. You know, 30 some hundred dollars for 15 channel processing, two subs, not four. But um, I, I, I'm amazed still that Anthem keeps the 70 and the 90 so close together in terms of all the things that they could do relative to the price gap that exists between them. Yeah, the 90 has the better DAX and the better guts and internals and all that. And it has the four subs and, and there's supposed to be a lot of value there. I haven't heard a 90. I haven't been able to compare and contrast a 90 to a 70. But for the price, especially as things are getting more expensive and now Denon and Marantz, you know, launch or is in the process of launching their new lineups and we see the prices on those going up. I, I think the Anthem is just spectacular and I would I would intend to be sticking with it probably for a good ways to come. And my, my next upgrade would probably be Anthem to Anthem because at some point in time, I would like to get probably four subs rolling in this room, cover all four of these corners and, and make a flip 
from a 70 to a 90 if I can. But we'll see what happens with that. Um, All Tech Geek says, there might be a hidden feature in Apple TV, otherwise A15. With 128 is plenty for a streaming box. Yeah, it's a powerful box. It's a powerful box. And I think, I think that there's a good chance of more to come. I'm very happy with these steps that Apple has taken. I know some people will really discount it and say, well, it's just like, you know, a, a marginal step from the prior box, but they really rounded out a whole bunch of engineering aspects of that box. And there, and even today, actually, there was news that they're going to um, update tvOS to support basically variable refresh rate and eliminate the black screen that you get as you switch between, you know, 60 Hertz and 24 Hertz and all that. So stuff is happening at Apple with Apple TV. And I'm really excited about that. And I think having a powerful box, hardware begets better software and capabilities and firmware. And I don't think people understand it all the time. Like, well, why, you know, and understanding the changes in a piece of hardware from one revision to another revision. And it's not always going to be a major talk, you know, land, land breaking um, increase in, in hardware capability, but hardware needs to march forward because software Every month, every quarter, every year, as features are added to apps, software grows in size and scope and what it needs to do and how it runs. And having more powerful hardware is part and parcel with having better software, which means having better apps, making the Netflix app better, letting it do more things and, and all of that. So I'm all for more frequent hardware upgrades. Um, you know, you don't always have to buy everything new when it comes out, although some things, you know, I, some things I definitely do. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we'll see what Apple does. I, I'm, I'm very excited for the future, uh, future of Apple TV. Shadman says, do you have any HomeKit enabled products that you use every day? I would recommend looking into HomeKit for the house. So I don't really use HomeKit at all. Technically, the only thing I use HomeKit for is in order for my control four system, which is what I do use for my home automation stuff, in order for control four to command and control an Apple TV, there's actually like, uh, you have to present the Apple TV through home kit and then control four can get to it. That's, that's it. So because I've already invested with control four, I, my, my doors, my lights, our ceiling fans, our HVAC, um, all of the distributed audio through our house, everything is control four based. So if I were doing stuff over again, I would probably look a little closer at, at a smaller scale home kit based automation system. Uh, but I've been in this house nine ish years now. Um, it was, it was built in, integrated in to control four kind of from the very beginning, we specced into it from the beginning of the build. And so um, we're, we're pretty well tied in, I think to that platform, that ecosystem going forward. Tech Geek says content is king. Yep, HT tours pull more viewers. Well, I hope so. I I really want to do more, more of that. Um, so the first tour of the theaters that I went to um, from this this past weekend is actually going to come on Monday. So that's the Formosa Home Theater. Um, Kevin he has a build thread on ABS uh, and has detailed detailed his room. Um, really nice, accessible. I'd say uh, moderately budget or moderate budget room, but he, you know, he did risers, he did two rows. He's got the big 135 inch screen, JVC NX5 projector, 418 inch subwoofers, all triad speakers, really nice equipment rack outside of his room. And um, it, it really, it really worked. It re the room really, really performed very nicely. It, it had, it had impact. It had, Excellent projection, of course, with our, our Seymour screen in that NX5. I'll say that's pretty great. That's what I have in here. Um, so I, I endorse those two brands and those two decisions myself. Um, <clears throat> Yamaha processing there. I think he's got some opportunity for some of his, his next upgrades to go into Anthem and, and maybe get some better processing and room correction and stuff. But um, so that video is coming on Monday and I kind of tried to do it like an interview. I got some B, a bunch of B-roll of his room and how he's got it set up. We went through a series of questions and building from that one. I do want to get out around like the Midwest, around Michigan, um, discovering more and more. There's a bunch of people in this area, in this hobby with spaces, large and small, um, 
So yeah, I think it'd be awesome to do more, do more visits, do more tours and, and get out and show, you know, showcase, uh, the Michigan home theater power. So be working on that soon. Um, Multi Geek says, can you suggest a good Blu-ray disc player using a PS5? There's no Dolby Vision. Not sure it will come to PS5 for discs. So right now, I don't even actually have a disc spinner in my setup at all. I did sell off my Series X and I sold off my PlayStation, um, intending to kind of double down that if I'm going to do AAA high-end gaming, I'm going on the PC for it. Um, or even in some ways, considering pulling back even a little bit more and saying that Apple TV gaming might be enough for me. But I would pretty much support what movie 2099 says here. If I was, if I were to go out right now and look for a, uh, a, a Blu-ray player, I'd probably just default to a Panasonic. Um, something in that UB model lineup, you know, spend up as much as you need to for the build chassis quality and the features that you need it to support. Um, that's an easy choice. <clears throat> the Ravon players are out there. Um, cost a little bit more, I think. I haven't really looked into the state of of how they how they've been operating but to me that those are the models that represent like the next best approximation of what an oppo blu-ray player would be and of course the 203 and the 205 are like the all-time classic <laughs> all-time classic disc spinners long out of production but that's when i when i really did play more physical media from the physical discs that's what i was using the bulk of my time. But if I was going to go buy something to put in my system, I would probably just buy a Panasonic. Sigmund Judd says, Jeremy, love your channel. Um, QMS concern for the new Apple TV. Currently building multi-purpose space for home theater. Learn lots. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. So um, I don't know how long you you might have known about the channel, but I, I've tried to do from the very beginning of the channel, I did what I called like a home theater builder series. And I, I did a series of videos on all the different facets of what was in my mind when I put kind of the version one of my room together. And then, of course, at, at the turn of 2022, did the whole overhaul, got up to the bigger scope screen, switched everything to the in walls and covered all that with with all the vlogs and, and everything. So two full <laughs> two full build outs of my theater detailed in the history of the channel there that I hope folks benefit from, you know, being able to see and include into their builds. So the Devastator says, how are you liking Arc Genesis um, with time alignment? Is the LFE any good? Um, so again, I'm a huge Anthem fan. Um, I, I'm very happy with the device and Arc Genesis is a big part of being happy uh, with that device. The way, you know, being able to, to run it off the laptop, I, I think it's a, a very nicely designed uh, piece of software from the way it looks, the way it works, its usability and its power and capabilities. And with the delay, uh, the phase uh, elements and all of that, that they've added in well, the last few months anyway, maybe since summertime. Um, I just trust it. I, I think it works. I, I think it works great. My room sounds great with it. And even hearing some other rooms uh, EQ'd, uh, one of the rooms actually this past, excuse me, this past weekend also was driven off of an ABM 70. Uh, one was a Trinoff, and then one was a, a Yamaha. Um, I, I like what Anthem does, and I trust what Arc Genesis is doing. I feel I've got a good handle on the software and what I would like to tweak within it. Something that I do need to do with regards to like my LFE kind of getting better is uh, where my subs are right now. They're kind of not right in the corners. They're maybe a, a, a two-ish feet in off the walls. I kind of started with them there a little bit from an aesthetics point of view, because I've got this black rug like down below my screen. And so the black subs kind of hug the edges of the black rug, but the, the subs, um, according to measurements kind of sit in a, in a pretty deep, like 50 Hertz null. And so Genesis, I think is doing a lot of work to try to pull that null out and, and, and adjust for it and, and, and that and all the EQ. So one of the one of the things that I intend to do coming up here, hopefully within the next week or, or two weeks at least, is I want to do kind of like a subwoofer crawl in, in video, right? And cover it on the channel and try to see if I can shuffle my subs around a bit to essentially eliminate that that 50 hertz null with placement. So then I can rerun Genesis, rerun all the arc settings and calibration 
without it having to do its own compensation for that null. And I'm very, very curious to see, you know, after that's all said and done, what, like, what are the results? Does anything change? Um, you know, the processing power of a, of a room EQ system is based on a certain limited uh, amount of like computational power and filters and, and that sort of thing in the hardware. So the more it has to do, you know, eventually it hits some limits or the less it can do if it hits like some finite uh, limitations of its, of its computational power and its filtering capability. So the better that you can get things ahead of the room correction doing its thing, I think ultimately the better off you are. So look for that um, probably sometime here in November. I just need to get down here, do the actual act of moving stuff around, you know, with, with some measurements up and see what happens when I put subs in different places and, and not necessarily worry about aesthetically where they're sitting, but try to get them where they want to be for top end performance and then re redo the whole arc and, and hopefully, um, experience it is that much better we'll see what we'll see what quote unquote better uh better becomes so all tech geek says there's a lot of debate on atmos speaker placement can you shed some light on it so i think you're probably talking about um chana techno dad he's been playing with all those atmos mixes and on like daily hi-fi show uh and those guys right they're, they're, he's been saying a lot about heights versus overheads um and in that I haven't actually broken out uh, some of the mixes that he's made. I, I want to do that and kind of see see how they play uh, in my space, you know, where where the sound is coming from. I'll say I, I don't think I think in some ways it's kind of like splitting hairs. And to me, if you're if you choose tops or you choose heights, it's it's really more predicated by the integration piece than worrying about is one like truly better than the other. Both of them are going to put sound up above you. Both of them are going to create, I, I think, a, a fine bubble effect. Um, you know, you're going to get, you're going to get sound moving. You're going to get sound moving to places where you want it kind of coming from and, and hearing it. And in my space, I've had both actually. So I went almost four years with heights with, with those uh, Aria, Focal Aria 906 bookshelves on stands kind of hanging from the wall, tipped down a little bit had up two in the front, two in the back. They were effectively like directly over the left and rights and, and the rear surround placements were pretty close too. And then when I redid the build and I went all integrated and all in walls, I went to tops. And so I think they're both really good. To me, I like the concept of the tops better than the heights simply because it allows more separation from speaker to speaker. And a lot of people, especially too, I think if you don't have a very high ceiling and you've got heights that are only like a foot or a couple of feet effectively above, you know, what might be a tower or might be another speaker like that, you're not, I don't think you're really separating them enough to really have them like bubble, bubble the sound around your room. I benefit in here because I've got almost 11 foot ceilings. And I think I still like the idea, the fundamental idea of having the height, uh, sorry, the tops more than the heights, just because everything is moved. It's all further away from each other and you get a bit better of a separation. You get better of a bubble. And, and I really favor the integration. So heights, I think do better. You kind of have to have the speaker in the room or, you know, mounted up into the um, crook of the ceiling and the wall so that it can sit up in that 90, you know, on an angle facing down. A lot of height speakers are made that way. I couldn't do that in here. I've got crown trim around the tray kind of of my ceiling um, and my soffits in here. So getting getting speakers right up in there. So I like I like what I have. I'm very happy with tops and you know, I, I would recommend them. Um, but, you know, do, do what works best more so for your install. Uh, I think I would say we're worrying about either one. Uh, movie 29 i says from an x theater build i'm shooting for home theater the month on avs yeah that'd be cool might start a youtube channel showcase yeah do it it's awesome might become a dealer go all in like this hobby is so fun there's so many ways to execute it um and get get involved with it i know a couple of other guys um that you know started with kind of their own thing and now they're 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 resellers they're they're installers and, and all that Let's 
So Chadman PA says, was going to go to an Anthem 1140. We decided to go to Cinema Marantz for future promise of direct spatial for independent sub outs. Any thoughts on direct spatial from things you've heard? So I haven't really heard much of anything. Um, uh, just some mentions about it on a podcast that I've seen. And then there's, there's kind of, I think, two levels to the stuff that Dirac is planning to do coming up. Uh, and I think there might even be some misunderstandings in a lot of places about what, what that is. Like the, the idea of like spatial subs where s subwoofers send bass to speakers in their zones or the idea of how the Dirac is supposed to be running other speakers full range in order to compensate for nulls and bass response. Those are, I, I understand that those are kind of like two different concepts with regards to what they're doing. Um, I don't know that, that it's entirely clear to me, like which is coming when and what devices it's coming to what, um, my only holdout about that sort of stuff is, um, you know, things are vaporware until they're readily available and Dirac on these new Denon Marantz's is, is promised for spring, uh, you know, or intended to be released around spring. And then are you going to get all the, the Dirac features then, or is it going to take even longer to get some in, some of them w waiting waiting for technology features always makes me a little bit nervous um so but i hope it i hope it works out we'll see and i do hope to get my hands on some of those devices as well i'd love to have a 3800 uh receiver and fire it up as a preamp and and check it out um, i have been talking to a couple of different places to maybe procure that from so we'll see what happens going forward again as, as i make more connections get my hand on more stuff um, hopefully coming up, I, I'm very excited to make some content around it and give my, give my thoughts. Uh, Jed says you try the REW room simulator for sub placement first. Yeah, that's something that I also intend to, uh, to mess around with a bit. Um, I'm going to talk with actually some other channels as well about kind of maybe, uh, getting set up with REW and messing around with that a bit more. I'm really, really intrigued to run a, the, like the, the, the sound decay, um, measurement out of that software and kind of see where I'm at with that. Um, Ahmed Khalil says, do you have any experience with Arkham's? Um, I don't, I have not ever used an Arkham device. Um, I thought about buying, uh, I think is the AV40 when I decided to pull, uh, spend my money on the Anthem AVM70 instead. So that's as close as I've been to, um, to one of their devices. I don't think actually I, I've been in any rooms that use them as well. Um, I know another, another local guy from this past weekend has an Anthem. Uh, another guy has the JBL synthesis um, equivalent of the Arkham. Um, but sorry, I haven't, I haven't used one myself. Uh, just shooting down here. Other folks giving recommendations. That's awesome. A lot of pluses for the Panasonic Blu-ray players. <clears throat> oh, Julius, this is an interesting question. I heard Europe is placing restraints on power-hungry electronics. Therefore, they will not be able to manufacture 8K TVs. Um, so I, I did hear some interesting conversation about this on a podcast recently, AV Rant podcast, actually. It was from uh, one, one of the, the recent episodes. And what what I, I'm pretty sure it was that one. But what, what, what the discussion was saying was, yeah, there's all this conjecture about lim limiting the amount of power that devices can can use. And of course, you're driving more pixels. You're going to drive things brighter. You're going to need more power to run an 8K TV than a 4K TV. That's a pretty natural assumption. And, and that might put it past a certain threshold. But there is... Uh, there was some conjecture or uh, some reading into the the details of the rules that suggested that it's not necessarily about, um, or I'm sorry, that these like that this legislation could cut off the maximum power draw of a television, but it could dictate what the out of the box power draw of the television might be. So um, it might get to the fact where going forward, these and even in the U.S. or wherever around the world, right, a TV manufacturer might just put a TV in all of its most limited, reduced performance power saving modes out of the box. So the majority of the populace, right? Not, not us folks, of course here, but the majority of the populace that buys a TV, brings it home, plugs it in using it, then is going to 
going to burn less energy and that will result in probably a whole lot less televisions sucking up a whole lot less power but if you know what you're doing you know how to set up your tvs you're you're in to the enthusiast space and and you know you 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 would still ideally be able to go into the settings and turn off the power limiting things and be able to put it in a mode to get your brightness back and and so on whether that specifically cuts off like 8k at the knees or again you would still be able to ultimately buy an 8k television and just have it you know come out of the box depowered we'll, we'll see so i thought i thought that was an interesting um loophole or element to some of the some of the discussion ultimately right the the tv makers and in technology is, is going to march forward and they need to make something new you know new features new new standards new new technologies in order to try to get people keep people moving forward and in and, and buy new televisions with bigger numbers and 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 sexy new features so yeah we'll see <clears throat> there's a whole lot more development i think that needs to happen in the 4k realm before i would even worry about uh, 8k I'm just looking here more talk about the uh, Blu-ray drives. Ian Vanterpool says, great work. Keep it up. Just got the Apple TV 4K box. Use it for media. Do you have a video setting on your media on your home network? Want to use it for media. Do you have a video? Oh, okay. Sorry. Video on setting up your media on your home network. So uh, I have made a couple videos for local media serving with Apple TV using Infuse um, for the, the the rip stuff that I've done on the channel and the, the local media that I do have set up, uh, which I am growing that library. I'm continuing to grow that library a little bit. TBD, to what extent I might grow it and how, how I may use it. But I really like um, I really like Infuse as an app. And I think there's two or three videos on the channel now kind of introducing Infuse uh, at a high level, talking about how I use it, um, what I use it for. I probably could follow those up with some more deliberately detailed how to's. Um, the way that I use it, I have a Synology server set up, uh, you know, an array of hard drives in there. Uh, there's shared folders that the Synology that the Synology publishes out onto the local network. And Infuse makes it real easy to just basically find servers on your network, you know, connect to those uh, to those shared folders essentially, and then it runs, it indexes everything, um, and presents it. I think that would also be a, a neat idea potentially for a future live stream, where we could kind of hang out for a while and do like an extended like let's pull up Infuse, let's look at these settings, and you know, and and, and talk about how it works and and what the things do and all of that. So I've got some ideas in my mind for like longer form live how to ish kind of streams. Um, and yeah, we'll see what, we'll see where that idea goes. Yeah. All tech geek says Apple TV has Plex also iTunes. Um, yeah. If, if you're going to serve local um, I, I think the infuse app is a little superior on Apple TV to Plex and Infuse actually can pull the data from a Plex server. So if you have your NAS set up with Plex, Infuse can also connect to the Plex, uh, to the Plex server itself to pull metadata and manage watch history and all that stuff. Yeah. Ian says Plex on my shield Infuse is more easy than Plex. Yep. You always have to feed it. Yeah. I, I, I just, I, I like Infuse. You don't have to manage a server really at all. You kind of just manage everything in the app itself. Um, Rand man says I'm adding acoustic panels to my walls, but no plan yet on ceiling panels is, is a lot. It's a lot harder to do ceilings. Any observations on how your ceiling acoustic panels made a difference. I can't say that they make any audible difference to like coming in here and sitting down and watching a movie since I put them up. And I did do the video where I at least took, uh, like, uh, response measurements in the room. And aside from a little, little minor variations, which might not even be attributed to the ceiling panels, could have just been like microphone placement or, or back, you know, background um, noise floor level uh, differences. Hard to say. What I really, really needed to do is have had have had busted out REW and measured the decay time of the space before I put the panels in in the ceiling 
and then after the panels and see if that made any difference. I think that would have been the, um, the better measure if they were actually effective at doing anything. So I don't know, this might've been the worst 600 bucks. I'm looking at them up here. Might've been the worst 600 bucks I've ever spent. Um, they look pretty darn cool up there. So I, I like the patterns and, and all that. Um, sure was a pain in the butt getting them to stick. I wish I would have, I wish I would have went with that, that I think ultimately it was the 74 3M foaming 74 glue that they haven't fallen. They haven't fallen since that. And then pretty much everyone that hasn't had the 74 glue on it um, has fallen and been reaffixed with the 74 now. And they've all been up there, you know, despite all of the road work and construction that's been going on in our neighborhood, basically shaking our house like an earthquake. So I don't even know what damage might have been done to our house in the last six weeks of having our sewers rerun and our road repaved outside. So, um, yeah, I, I think, I guess to round out that question, ceiling panels get lauded as being, you know, of major, major importance. Dialogue clarity is really important to me, being able to understand what people say and having those reflections off the ceiling get broken up a little bit, you know, has to have some positive effect, but I don't know. I, I don't think I'm a golden ear and it's hard. It's hard for me to say that it, it's, it's a t tangibly better, you know, or different than it was before. Sounds good. So. Let's see. All tech geeks says, have you any experience ever, have you experienced near field subwoofers? Any suggestions on low pass crossover frequencies? So I have experienced low uh, near field subwoofers as a result of going to these different meetups. So um, there was one a few weeks ago and that I went to, and then um, the Spartan home theater is the second room that I was able to go to last, or last weekend, the first one last Saturday. So uh, love to fly Lars on ABS forum. He was actually an ABS home. He was the home theater of the month, I think from February ish, one of the first months of this year. Uh, his room was detailed and he's got, he's got base response, tactile and all of that, uh, dialed in to the nines. There's another person, um, uh, off of ABS forum that hosted a meetup a few weeks ago, which is just like a base phenom room as well. Big box, excuse me, big box subwoofers, you know, sitting right behind the seats, um, and in the Spartan theater as well with tactile plates and, and, uh, shakers and all of that stuff going on. I think it's pretty cool. I think it needs to be done right. Um, to me, like uh, too much tactile, uh, too much shaking to me would get old. And I don't think that if I were to do that or go down that road in my space, I don't know that my family would appreciate it if it, if it's overbearing, um, kind of the nice element of maybe doing it a little more discreetly per chair rather than um, in a row that goes kind of some a lesson learned or one takeaway that I that I had from last weekend and get to in a minute. But I, I kind of feel that when I add more subwoofers in here, I might do some near field stuff. I might put them close up here behind the seatings or I can go back to the couches. I kind of have the benefit down here, though, where I'm in a basement, I'm on the concrete slab and the concrete doesn't really move. So I feel like even with just these dual um, Arundel 1723 2Ss, like my couch shakes as it is, because that wave comes across the floor. It's not moving the floor. So it's coming right into the couch and the couch is going to be the thing that moves. But a little tactile to me um, adds, adds a dimension. It, I think it's fun. I don't need to be, you know, on a, a roller coaster ride or anything like that for my, my, my level of tactile engagement. But um, it's cool. In terms of setting them up, though, I haven't really done it. Um, I, and I'm, I'm not sure. I, I know like the best, the, there are some differences, I think, in the best practice of tuning a sub that is near field versus one that is not. Um, but I, I don't want to give advice because I, I don't, I couldn't pull the, the specific right or wrong way um, to do that off the top of my head. Um, maybe particularly when I get it to some other, hopefully upcoming theater tours, around the area, some of the guys that have those types of setups, that's something that, that I can talk about with them. 
Uh, Chadman PAC, so are you happy with your LG D283? Same price as the A90J. Plan to mount it in a basement, mostly for movie show sports, and a 5.2 system uh, to start with some perlis and in walls. Oh, I like those perlis and in walls. Um, yeah, so LG G283, I've been very happy with it. I think it looks great. Um, I think the firmware engineers at LG uh, need to take some more classes or something, and they need to get on the ball making better software. Um, I've been frustrated with how it works in conjunction with my Control 4 system uh, almost from the very beginning. And even till now, it, it doesn't, it, the TV just doesn't work properly with uh, command and control kind of elements. And at all the bugs, even with its own remote, not turning on properly. Some of the firmware upgrades have made it better. At least right now, I can actually use my Control 4 system to power on the TV and power it off when I turn the room off. But I still like, I, I can't just like grab my control four remote and say, okay, living room, go to the PC and expect that the, the control four will turn on the LG and get it to the right input all in one operation. There's like these lag times involved when the TV starts up that it won't take the command and control signals to change inputs. So anyway, a whole bunch of like integration fumbles, I think on the LG side there. I think the LG versus Sony uh, choice is a very interesting one. And I've actually had this conversation with a handful of folks since buying the LG, some friends, uh, some other local folks some family and whatnot looking for TVs. And it's like, well, well, okay, why would I recommend an LG versus a Sony? And I would say quite honestly, I bought the LG more for the gaming features or to make choosing LG because I wanted the gaming features. I wanted to be able to plug in my you know, high-end gaming PC, NVIDIA GPU, have VRR work with real G-Sync, have the game optimizer, be able to pull up the menus that shows me refresh rate, variable refresh rate, and all those details. And Sony doesn't do that stuff. I really hope at some point, who knows, maybe 2023, Sony TVs will finally get like a real game, uh, de detailed game info, gaming info screen. Um, that would be, I think, very nice. Um, I do think the motion, I do notice the motion uh, from the Sony to the LG, I had the X900H before, and I've got the, of course, with the LG now. Um, the LG has been the first TV where I've actually turned up uh, any kind of like motion uh, de judder setting because my wife and I both watching, you know, 24 hertz content, some TV shows and, and stuff there, and having pans judder. Never really noticed that on my Sony. Sony covers that up just naturally very well. And that, that judders there a bit on the LG. So all that said, ultimately what I've just been telling folks that have asked me is, uh, you know, if I want a big OLED or I want a big TV, should I buy the Sony or should I buy the LG? Um, you know, all the other channels have done all the shootouts and, and value electronics and stuff. They've done all the shootouts. The Sony A90J looks to be a great TV. I think technically that's the one that won, won the shootouts. So I don't know if you're going just for movies, movies, TV show, video content, probably just take the Sony. Um, if you want gaming and you want to make sure you have access to some of those gaming features, then I think you're going to maybe have a preference uh, towards the LG. Um, it, do, it does tick me off every time I turn try to turn this thing on, though, and it doesn't work the way it's supposed to. Whereas I know Sony, Sony is is on the ball with their televisions and IP control, command and control, control for integration and all of that. So a bit of a bummer in that regard, but it looks great. I love watching it. Uh, movie 29, what's your favorite movie to demo your theater? Um, so, I mean, demos, We when I've had folks over and we've gone around to these meets where everybody kind of settles into a lot of the same material lately, um, like Re Ready Player One, I've watched the race scene a couple hundred times, well, maybe not that much, uh, some dozens of times, uh, but I've never actually watched that whole movie yet. Um, the Batman scene, the Batmobile, where he comes out chasing the penguin down the highway through the exploding truck where he jumps through. That's a super popular one um, that, that shows off a bunch of stuff, particularly when uh, the Penguin's car rolls over 
And are you hearing the, uh, you know, the, 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 the utmost effect in the bubble effect of all of that stuff going on around him? But as the Batman, as a movie, I still haven't actually watched, um, watched the whole movie yet. Um, John Wick has some great scenes in it for demos, the night, the nightclub scene in number one. Um, and this past weekend, we were playing a lot of the tunnel scene at the end of number two, where he, he switches guns a couple times. It's pretty awesome. He finally gets to like the big like shotgun. And, and I we were, we were in the Spartan theater playing that one. And as soon as he pulled that out and started, started popping that off, like everybody just like, th there was an audible chuckle, through the whole room it's just like wow that's that's just that's just awesome um yeah other demo stuff I, that i've been seeing a lot of has been like the harry potter the the one scene with the wands um at the it's one of the deathly hollows movie towards the end where harry and voldemort in their wands hit and engage that's like a a great tone mapping one that comes up a lot, 1917, the guy going up the steps. Um, and uh, as, as a good measure of HDR and tone mapping and what kind of shadow detail you get out of that. Yeah. Um, in terms of like a favorite, whole favorite movie though, that's, you know, that's, it's really more about demos. Sh showing off the home theater is really more about clips, I would say, than, than whole movies. Um, we had a good time, of course, with Top Gun. That was probably the last movie uh, in a while where we actually sat down and watched a whole movie with some other folks in here. We had friends over, watched the Kaleidoscape version shortly after it went live, and uh, that was pretty sweet. All Tech Geek, what is your reference point when experiencing other home theaters or tweaking your own? Um, I'm not sure exactly what you mean by reference point. If you want to clarify, clarify that. Uh, Sigmund Judge, point of view of sustainability and waste. What's your take on bull projectors versus laser? Something to me that's right about the lack of laser projector replacement parts. Yeah, I, I guess I don't know. I don't. I, I Really, it, it's been so long since I've replaced a bulb and a projector. I've got about a thousand hours on my NX7, a little more than a thousand hours. So I've still got time on my first bulb um, in that projector that I'm not quite sure what I would even do with that one. I'll have to Google. What, what do you do with a projector bulb? Do you feels like you don't just throw stuff like that in the trash anymore? Uh, maybe find like an electronics recycling center or a lot of stuff like I'll take to Best Buy. Um, I, actually, there's a few things that have fried out on me, my old um, UMA and a couple other devices that I had to replace that um, I don't just want to e-waste into the trash. So I'll take those to Best Buy and recycle them. Um, lasers, though, yeah, at some point in time, you burn up that laser, you got to kind of replace the whole unit. Seems like that would be a little bit more wasteful than than replacing a bulb, but I don't know. I haven't, I haven't looked at the details of, I, I guess, what the sustainability or the waste removal reduction step is. And if, if you have your laser module replaced, you know, in one of these Sony's Epson's or JVC's or whatever, um, what do you do with the old one? Is there somewhere to send it to and it can get, you know, get e-cycled? Um, that's an interesting question. I haven't had to cross that one yet, but I'm probably not too too long away, maybe 2023, provided I'm still using the NX7 through 2023 that I'll be be dropping a new bulb in there. And, and even in the past, if I go back to my earlier days, um, 2000 to 2007, um, projector models were turning over quite a bit then. Uh, that was in our first home. I had a 92 inch front projection set up in my living room. And quite honestly, I was buying projectors faster than I was burning up bulbs. So I never, I don't think I ever replaced a bulb in a projector um, because the new models came out and I was up, I was upgrading models back then. Uh, Devastator says, I wish Anthem would allow us to add PEQ filters so we can add a Harman curve. Um, you can, you have a lot of facility in Genesis to adjust the, uh, 
adjust the target curves. And so it's not as easy as uh, I think some of the direct software makes it where you can basically download a, a data map or a data set and import it to apply a custom curve. You kind of have to change some other values and you, but, but you can, you can fully functionally make a Harman style curve in our Genesis and without too much trouble, the videos that I have on the Anthem, I, I basically do that. That's, that's essentially the curve that I run in my Anthem right now. Uh, a good, you know, 10 dB ish, 8 dB ish higher on the base than on the, uh, than the level on the highest of the high frequencies and it slopes down and, and swoops down accordingly. It's pretty, it's, it's not too hard to do. There's the room gain setting. You got a little bit of deep base boost, deep base boost, and then the tilt. Um, All Tech Geek says, gravity in midway, especially demos, height channels. Yeah, Ready Player One, base heavy. Yeah, gravity, actually. Gravity is one that w w got pulled up uh, a few times this past weekend. We did gravity both in um, the Spartan Theater and we did it at Arts on the Christie. And Oh, my God. If you want to talk about a star field. You, you haven't seen a star field in home theater until you've seen star field. Um, a star field on a Christie. And so, yeah, the, the gravity scene, and actually af after all the home theater stuff last weekend, I, I drove with, I actually drove with Kevin from the Formosa, um, his Formosa theater, the one that's the video that's coming on Monday. And then an old uh, best friend of mine went as well. So we came back, uh, Kevin had to go, but my, my other friend came in. It's like, all right, let's go downstairs into my room, into this room and play some of these demos while we still got some audible audio video memory of, of what we saw today at a couple other places. And so, yeah, pulled up, pulled up gravity, the scene at um, basically towards the beginning where, uh, you know, they're out working on the Hubble or, uh, and they get the indication that the satellites collided and all the stuff is going on and the, and the debris field comes through. And that one really puts the voices around in your Atmos speakers, uh, basically, you know, Houston or mission control talking to him, um, and kind of hearing from his perspective as he's twisting and moving in space, there's, there's a bunch, bunch of uh, overhead action and surround action with, with those voices coming from appropriate places. And then of course the video side of things, that movie needs a 4k, uh, 4k transfer very much. So, so I think this is the clarification. When you tour other home theater demos, do you compare with your setup? Know, or with the local movie theater. So yeah, that that's that goes kind of back to what I was talking about earlier, right? When you go to other people's spaces, it really helps to create perspective. And and so uh, you know, pr prior even to getting involved with other folks and doing um doing meetups and stuff, I bought a lot of equipment without really even experiencing it, right? Based on hearsay, based on watching YouTube videos, based on reading other owners impressions on forums and, and all of that. And, um, but, and even like going to a theater shop, which are, are unfortunately in precious short supply nowadays, you know, listening to something in a shop is still very different than listening to an integrated system and, and getting some, getting some takeaways, right. Based on what a person did holistically in their system to inspire ideas for yourself. So absolutely every room, every other room that I went to, which now I think is about five or six around Southeast Michigan. Um, you know, I, I, I'm absolutely comparing them in my mind to, to my room, uh, and to each other. And, and it's not about, you know, comparing them in a negative way or like, you know, ranking them or like this one was good and that one was bad. It's, it's about like understanding, you know, everybody does, um, they, they made the decisions in their room to fulfill their goals, you know, to, to highlight the things that they like out of an audio video experience. And in some cases that might be the same as me or each other. And in some cases it might not. And so there's no like really good or bad judgment to it. It's just a matter of, of different, you know, different focus, um, different parts of the room or parts of the build where more of the dollars might've been put or different ways of doing things, different ways to accomplish stuff in the room. Um, and again, taking, taking the inspiration and every space I've been in, I would say I've left with some kind of an idea of like, oh yeah, I like that. And, and I'm going to try to do that, or I'm going to keep that in mind 
when, um, you know, when, when, when the time comes for me to do it. And if I were to, to, you know, muse on a couple of those things, I would say every room, every other room I've been in has home theater chairs, recliners. I've got the couch here. Family is really attached to this couch. It, it kind of bums me out. I thought I had my kids on board, um, for supporting the idea of, of getting chairs, but I really want chairs. I find the couch uncomfortable being in all these other theaters and sitting comfortably in chairs. I, I really like the chairs. So there, there's a huge reinforcement to me there, which is great. Like having sat in five or six theaters, all with different brands or models or whatever of chairs get, you know, um, I like them all. <laughs> so, so that's, that's good. Um, another room that I was in Jared's room, actually, he's got a, he's got a much smaller, tighter space, uh, one row of seats, but in lieu of a second row of seats, uh, he had a kind of like high bar table behind his chairs with stools. So you could get extra people in the room. They would still have a place to sit and set a drink down. Is that the most comfortable spot in the room to watch a movie, you know, for a full two hours and stuff? No, maybe not, but it, it still lets you get more people in the room and play around and demo things and all of that. And so I thought that was a fantastic idea and something that I could emulate in here because as the, my room is right now, I'm not putting a, I'm not putting a full on second row back there the way I have things, but I could pull this couch forward another six inches or eight inches. And I could get, if I did get chairs, I could put a high bar table behind it and be able to comfortably sit, you know, four more bodies in here. So that was a really great idea and, um, absolutely something that I might, kind of look, uh, look to steal in the future. The, the platform E base shaker stuff that Lars had set up in, in his Spartan theater was, was really cool. If I do go to chairs and, and want to add something tactile, uh, I think I would look to that or, or look to some inspiration there. Um, actually being at those, being at those theaters this last, this last weekend as well, has completely inspired me, I think, for what version, like maybe not even be 3.0, 4.0, something down the road, though, where um, I think this room is great. But one of the things that I talked about in the channel to date in the videos that that really drove the room is I didn't want to gut it. I didn't want to tear it down. And I, I built within the kind confines of what I had. Um, and little did I know also uh, one of the negative side effects of going from the in-room speakers to the integrated speakers, I, I didn't really give it a whole lot of credence, is opening up all of these spaces in, in the wall, in the in the structure of the room to put the speakers in. I think there's a lot, there is more sound that kind of leeches out of here. So, and, and I think it was particularly being in the Spartan Theater on Saturday. And the thing about Lars's room is, and, and you can see both of those. You can see Kevin's, the Formosa Theater. There's a build thread on ABS. Uh, I, I can't link it now, but I'll, I'll get it linked um, in the description. Of course, that tour is coming on Monday. I will get back to Lars's house and we will do a video, a uh, Spartan tour video at some point coming up. But Spartan, Spartan Theater's fit and finish was just exceptional that was like a completely DIY project. He, he, he did the work him and his son. And I was just floored by the way it looked. And, and I realized that like, that's, that's what you get when you kind of build out purposefully from the ground up. And so I, I think my future, that that's what I would want to get to a, a much more styled, um, integrated type of room. I could even try Let's try something here. If I flip the layout and I try to share a screen. And I come over here. I'm going to have to do this one a little bit blind. I hope. Let's see if we go back. Yep. Everybody can see this, I, I hope. Um, here's some shots I took. And a couple of movies. So if this plays, this is Kevin's theater. This is the Formosa. So try it in walls. He's got the JVC NX5 up there. Two rows. That second row is kind of up against the back wall. A lot of um, customization into where the speakers went, padding on the walls, all of that. Um, this is the room that will be coming in the video on Monday. 
quite a bit more details. I, I think he did a really good job in here. And that was that was pretty cool. This is the Spartan. And there's just there's something about this room that really, really hit me. And to say that, like, this is what I want the future of my theater to be. And how can I take the space that I have and turn it in to something like this? Um, and I think I can do that. And so I very much look forward at some point to doing that full gut gut out of here. Take the take everything out of here and patch up patch up holes i think i would invert my room right now i'm projecting i'm projecting onto a wall uh, on the far side i would move it i would be projecting instead uh, onto the wall here behind me and let's see you know, here's some some moving moving image of the spartan theater um do the two rows, put a riser in, shift the door over, basically a lot of framing, do the double drywall, the green glue, button it up, silence down my HVAC, take my projector and put it in my storage room on the other side of the wall there where all of the gear is. So it's not in the space, no fan noise. And, and I think I could get something like this. Um, I think I could get something like this in my room. And so this is really going to be pile theater 3.0, 4.0. .0. I don't know when probably going to be, it's going to be a long wait and there's going to be a bunch of other things I'll do in the space between now and then, but the columns, the tray, the soffits, the lighting, um, he did the movie poster panels everywhere, which I thought was a unique and personal touch. I'm not sure that I would do, I would do the movie posters. I think I'm more of a pattern, black, dark pattern on my panels, kind of, uh, kind of fan um but you know that's what you get when you get out and you experience other stuff is you you just come out man the whole, the whole way home when we were driving it was a two-hour drive home from arts we were just talking all of us in the car like okay you know what's our what's our long game what what's our what's our uh our long play for what we want to do in our spaces and you know just inspired you just you really get inspired and even littler stuff too, like the fact that um, when I, as I've been looking at chairs in here, one of the things that I had just been defaulting to was the idea of like buying a row of chairs, right? A shared row of chairs where you don't buy individual chairs, you buy the row. And, and but Lars, if I go back to this, actually, um, to really make sure this is visible, right? These are individual chairs put next to each other not a row with shared armrests. So you really had space. You really had space to spread out a bit. And it, it also goes hand in hand with kind of how he did the platforms and the tactile stuff and the shakers. So um, that was an important part of the design. But that, that was another little, a little takeaway that I didn't even realize at first. Excuse me. But after being in there for a while, realized, oh, like these are all individual chairs put together in a row. And there's some really interesting virtues to that. So yeah, all the things big, big and big and small. Um, so a couple questions, and then we'll talk a little bit about arts theater too. So you have, you have all speakers at the same DB level, or you prefer height channels to be a bit louder to add atmospheric experience. So I, I, my stuff is based on arc Genesis. The room is set to its curve and I let Genesis do what it needs to do to the speakers. Um, and I don't, I don't tweak the gains, um, above or below, um, above or below that. So to devastate, the devastator says you should do a video on how to add a Harmon curve. Yeah. Um, absolutely. I think that would also be something that maybe could be fun. Uh, to play around a bit in a live stream. And I mean, quite honestly, if I were to pull up an Arc Genesis configuration right here, we can take a minute and just show it. So this is the Arc Cal, Genesis Cal for the theater room, the one that's running in here right now. And after all the measurements are done, when you come in here to adjust targets, you can see my curve, right? This curve here, this black line. Let me make this a little bit bigger. Here's the curve. 
base region. We've got a sweep down kind of through the crossover region and then this ongoing tilt kind of out to the end. And in Genesis, you tweak this curve by these settings down here. So if I pop my rune gain down, I can bring the base regions of that down. I can also tweak the very tip of that curve. I can move the tilt up and down. And so you, you kind of just use those things in conjunction with each, with each other. I need to make sure not to save this. But that's, you know, there's a quick look basically at, 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 at how you do that. And, and there is some videos on the channel already. Check out the Anthem videos that talk a bit about like what I said and how I said it. But yeah, I can, we could absolutely do some more. I can do some more content on that um, in the future. Natives are getting restless up there. Um, Jurassic Park is a, is a movie demo recommendation. Yep, definitely. My son's getting almost to the point where we're ready to watch Jurassic Park. That'll be a fun one. He likes dinosaurs and stuff. But we're, we're pretty conservative on our movie watching. Really at the root of it, Jurassic Park is like a slasher film. But it is a good theater demo nonetheless. I uh, saw someone's laser replacement receipt on a Sony. It was over 10K. Yeah, it's, it's, I'm sure it's not cheap. Um, less than a new projector, but... Chet Presley asked, any major sound differences between a 714 versus 916 and any of the tours you did? So let's see. Last weekend, Kevin's theater was technically 7.4.4. Lars's, the, the Spartan theater, was 9 point, some many, um, 0.4. He had wides. There's wides in the front column of... Uh, front columns of the room which i thought was nice it it really lessens the gap between the front field behind the screen and then the first uh, surrounds on the sides um and then arts i don't even know honestly what the whole channel count in arts was there was i think he had wides there were multiple surrounds everything was so completely hidden and integrated you couldn't even count um in the way the way that went down it was uh, I, I, there was a lot of speakers. I, I don't know exactly what that count was. Um, but I, I think the, I, I think coming out of last weekend, it, it left me feeling like, well, wow, wides, wides are probably pretty cool and, and probably have, um, a, a good ability to create some more connection, uh, around the room. And so another thing, another takeaway, right. For the future of the theater, that if I were to flip this room around and I were to regut it and do, do all the stuff that I could do in here, I probably would think about some wides. Um, uh, and, and even again, and if I were to go to, to two rows in the long run, probably bu bumping up to the nine point, you know, basically going to the nine point X point six, assuming a 15 channel processor and all of that. I don't need it the way things are set up in here right now. And it would be uh, much harder to do it, but future rev pile theater three Oh four point Oh, We'll see. We might be talking wides and, and some extra speakers overhead. Um, Alta Geek says, experienced any Oro 3D demos? No, I have not experienced Oro. I, I know some of my uh, YouTube friends um, uh, talk a lot about Oro. I've, I've, not, I've not had the Oro epiphany yet <laughs> or, or a chance to mess around with Oro uh, at all. Uh, TTK, evening. Yeah, awesome. Love your channel. Um, I swear we're like we're like brothers. <laughs> we need to get together and hang out sometime. Um, the the PC building and, and the way you go about messing around with your stuff, uh, custom arcade, video game cabinets, and all that. And I'm a, I'm on board for for all that stuff. Yeah, Julia says the Spartan is very nice. Love it. Yep. Yeah, AVS Home Theater of the Month. So I'm looking forward to getting getting back there so but we're already at an hour 20 time is flying here i'm talking a lot but let me let me let me share a couple thoughts on arts theater this this thing was nuts i unfortunately failed in my duties to um, take any reasonable good amount of pictures at arts so let me just jump to this one i suppose uh, so this is his room. Um, the room is actually on the second floor of his home. And just to like give credit where credit's due, 
like this was this was beyond a home theater meetup. Um, this was like a, a soiree, a, a high end party. Um, bartenders uh, at an open bar, cater taco bar, like so many people coming in throughout the day. So they actually had us do the demos in waves. So when, when we checked in, we got our name tags and all that. They were color coded and they would call groups of people into the room uh, for a fixed demo. You can kind of see some of the stuff that was in the demo reel. Star Trek motion picture, Starfield, uh, John Wick 3, Frozen 2, Doctor Strange, Avatar, First Man, um, and a few other things uh, on that list as well. And so then they would run the demo. And then my, my uh, Kevin and my other friend Cody, the guys that I went with, we, we ended up actually in the last demo scene. And then after that, a lot of people had left and it was kind of just like the, the real hardcore. The real hardcore were left standing and um, the demoing and the tinkering in the room went on well, well into the evening, I believe. I think they even watched Top Gun. Um, uh, but, but we had a two hour drive coming back here and kids and all that stuff. So we, we didn't stay super long, but man, this theater, I don't even know what the price tag of this thing is. Um, gotta be over half a million, 600,000, maybe if not more, um, the, the one and only residential installation. Well, that, that we know of pu publicly known, uh, of the Christie eclipse. And this, no, let me see if I can, uh, there we go. Do a screen share, share a tab. Let's share this one. All right. Yeah, this is the Christie. I think if I recall correctly, art has the 17,000 lumen version of this. Uh, cause the guys running the demo had commented originally that they were running at 80% brightness. And then in the course of the evening, they bumped it up to a hundred, which was 17, 17, or I said net 17,000 lumens. But this projector is basically an OLED projector. It is black like an OLED. It is bright beyond anything you could possibly imagine in projection. Um, individually like addressable pixels, pixels, color space up to like full rec 2020 4k laser. We actually had to sign waivers not to look into the light. Don't look into the light. <laughs> it's the dangerous basically just like don't look into the sun. Right. Um, but man, so this thing's on the order of like $350,000, right? This, this projector on its own. Plus the however many 15 some plus speakers that Art had, like all JBL high end premium synthesis stuff, trin off processor. Uh, on it, I didn't get to see all of the stacks of everything, so I don't I don't know what the amps were actually. Uh, the screen was a Stewart, uh, I believe, something on the order of like 18 feet, 16, 17 feet wide, as you can see from the picture. Um, just just nuts he, he had the biggest kaleidoscape installation that i've ever seen just in, in the rack space that i saw i believe there were four disc vaults uh, and then inside the room where the projector actually sits uh, was more gear more kaleidoscape pieces and all of that i was disappointed though for whatever reason they chose not to run the demo off the k um, i was really hoping that they would have had the opportunity to showcase uh, kaleidoscape in the whole setup this this the room was all, everything everything was so premium it almost was like a bummer to to demo with rips off of an nvidia shield um not that there's anything wrong with that by any means but man like like kaleidoscape would have been perfect they could have set up uh, a, a demo script with all of the same scenes from all the same movies and and just you know just ripped right through them there was a lumigen in there doing uh, aspect ratio changes and all of that automatically um, Seton, Mark Seton from Seton Audio was there. Got to talk to him, introduce myself to him, um, offer up the idea that, hey, you ever want to, you know, do something? We could we could bring some Seton subs over here and, and set them up and, and play around and showcase them on the channel. Um, but I think there's 10, 18, 10, 18 inch subwoofers in that room or may, maybe even in excess of 10 stacks of four behind the screen and then more um, in the back of the room. Just absolutely nuts. The um, the stories go that they couldn't get this projector up the stairwell, so they had to open up a hole on the side of the house on the second floor to get it in. 
And with the, the chiller requirements and all of that, there's basically, they basically gutted out a, ba a, a bathroom behind the theater that became the projection room to house this thing. But I, I swear when, when the, when the images that this thing threw up were on the screen, I, I had never seen anything like that in my life um, in home theater. And I don't know that there is anything else that he, I could even possibly um, possibly compare it to. So I, I took a couple, I tried to take a couple shots off my phone. These are admittedly terrible, um, you know, taking pictures with the phone in a dark theater, but the, the light at, at that scale, it, just imagine, you know, whatever a 18 foot wide OLED screen is, is basically what it was and, and, and even brighter <laughs> true blacks and, and just even brighter. It, it was, it was crazy. And the room was just so well done. It was so well balanced. The audio was so functionally tied together. The bass wasn't overwhelming to the rest of the balance of the sound. Oh, excuse me. Mark did excellent work in there. The trin off was, was earning its <laughs> earning its name. Um, so I hadn't thought my room looked dim until I came home and watched a couple things here, um, after seeing arts and was, was a bit, uh, a bit disappointed. <laughs> so I do look forward to getting some more brightness in, in my projection setup here in the future. Um, we'll see not a Christie, but but, but man, so I, I hope, uh, I hope to get over there. I really would like to do some content on that room because I don't, you know, I can't even imagine what other theaters from a technical level, a gear perspective top that it's literally the best of just about everything you could want. Yeah. You know, in, in an audio video home theater setup, the, the absolute, the absolute pinnacle devices of everything. So SRW 1000, lucky enough to be there. Um, yeah, no way for a camera to capture what we saw. Nope. <laughs> it's almost, that's the thing like making tour videos and stuff. And I was debating when I was at, at Kevin's, it's like, should we take some video of like the system in action and, and put it and, and I don't know the right way to go about doing that. I got to work on my YouTube craft, I guess, but I, I don't know, like video, a video auto recording of a room just doesn't do it any, any justice. You kind of have to just describe it right be there and describe it and then there's all the other problems with youtube as well that if you record the movie playing it's video it's going to get a takedown and you can't have the audio snippets playing anyway so <clears throat> it's basically a tour you know tour vi tour videos without demonstrations but man i i would look forward to going back there i look forward to hopefully you know hopefully talking with art um doing something uh to, to really bring more details about that room to the channel going forward, but it's the pinnacle. Um, Alta Geek says, what's in your wish list with respect to audio equipment or HT setup? So the stuff that I think I will be doing soon um, or would look to be doing soon, well, immediately, of course, I got the new Apple TVs coming. So um, those... Uh, you know, that, that will go in. It's not going to be an epiphany or anything great, but, or, or, or groundbreakingly different uh, than what the current model is. The, the couple of things that I want to go after in here, again, I want to play with these sub positionings. The other thing per my videos on like adding the firm in and, and that stuff is I want to, I want to get after my noise floor and I want to get after the, the um, passive sound the buzzing, hissing kind of noises that come from my speakers. I want to get that eliminated, whether that's ground loops in my rack. And I bought a couple of devices. I bought this thing called a, a, a PS Audio Sound Harvester. Might be snake oil. I don't know. But I'll be doing a video on that. You're supposed to plug it into the outlet where your equipment is, and it's supposed to basically burn off uh, or absorb out noise from the line. So we'll see. I'm going to do a video on that one. They were 100 bucks a piece. Um, off of Amazon with free returns. So I'm gonna I'm going to do that. I really look forward to the new uh, control for Halo remotes because I am completely over this guy. Oh, there it is. Ready to ready to send send that ship sailing. Um, 
my Neo here in the theater actually suffers from image retention. You leave it on for a little while and, um, and it, it does kind of regular screen retention. And the one upstairs, nobody in the household admits to it, but somebody sat on it. Um, it got crunched. I don't think I did it, <clears throat> but so, and I want hard buttons. I'm, 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 I'm over so much of the, over so much of the touch screen. Um, I, I want some hard buttons. So yeah, as soon as I can get my hands on those halo remotes, uh, probably from Dan, uh, that Dan DiCarlo, my, my friend here, Southeast Michigan custom integrator and my control Four source, um, we'll get those in here. If I think a little longer, um, I think ahead, bigger upgrades that, that could come, uh, would be getting, getting to four subs that could also include or not include a, you know, an AVM 70 to an AVM 90 upgrade. I could still do four subs, but just have the 70 EQ them in pairs. Um, I would, and then the video side of things at some point, I would really like to, uh, get to an, you know, an NZ projector. Um, I, I was, I was loosely hunting, uh, a 4090 GPU upgrade for my gaming PC. Got the 3090 TI in there right now. And I would like to crank some games out at 120 FPS, uh, 4k native. Although I have to admit, I have to admit, I don't know if it's my old age or what, but when it comes to games, I'm playing this. <laughs> I'm playing this lately. Marvel Snap. 3090 Ti, $4,000 gaming PC. And I've, I've spent more time playing mobile games um, of late than, uh, than firing up that computer. Just based on time, my, my time and availability to do things. But <clears throat> so, yeah, we'll see if I do end up going... Uh, committed to the PC stick into the to the 4090 or not. Um, so yeah, that's a couple of the things I've got got that that I would like to do for my my space. You know, permanent purchases, things that I would buy. In terms of the channel, um, I, I'm talking to a I'm talking to a bunch of folks. So um, getting more connected to you know other uh, resellers and installers that uh, can get me some inroads to equipment. And so I've got a bunch of like irons in the fire, things smoldering, but I got to get over a hump to actually get, get some stuff in my hands. And we could be talking about playing with some really cool things on the channel um, into 2023. And I need, I need to get on those people, um, <laughs> get on those people and get, get some of that realized, but I discovered something. It was in the title for the live stream. So I got to make sure I talk about this. Has anybody heard of the Apple TV X, the Apple TV X. So this came, uh, across my radar just a day or so ago, uh, by, uh, chatting with folks on the Kscape owners forum. Um, we actually have an Apple TV thread going on there because we're talking about uh, movies on iTunes and, and Apple TV as well. And um, uh, one, of the, one of the other members there made a post in the Apple TV thread about this Apple TV X device. So let me share this. Let me stop sharing that um, page, that tab, and let's share this one. There you go. Apple TV X. So basically somebody, some real motivated and studious engineer tore down the Apple TV. This is the 2021 model 4K. And there's a couple of links here actually too. I'll share this, but they, they link out to YouTube and the guy's got just a really small channel, a couple of videos about kind of his tinkering. And what he did is, is, is replace a bunch of the power delivery, power interface of the Apple TV at a high level, basically, with a linear power supply. And so you can see the big box under the Apple TV and how he's got like this custom uh, custom wire output of the Apple TV. And it's lauded as being like uh, significantly reducing noise, jitter, and all of that um, on a really, really excellently designed circuit board and um, internal engineering design of the Apple TV itself, but taking it to the next level. And by reducing all this noise and providing this better power delivery, significantly cleaning up video and audio and making even like making even, even uh, streamed 
bitrate content and epiphany of higher fidelity and higher quality. And they're selling this thing at a nice, uh, nice markup there, right? 2,500 bucks. Um, but man, I, I am really interested to try this. So I've already reached out to these folks. I exchanged some emails with, I think Chris, who's the actual, the guy that kind of built this thing. Um, and I'm hoping to talk to them on Friday. I, I really want to demo. This is right up my alley. Um, I did the, I have done Oppo mods. I've done custom video game, um, hacky stuff. I'm a computer engineer. I know hardware and, and, and things like that. So, um, I would love nothing more than to get one of these in my hands and put it uh, on the LG OLED, uh, and put it in the theater here, uh, you know, input one Apple TV X input two standard old Apple TV and pull up the same content side by side. Um, and, and really put it through some paces like that, playing both streaming content, playing, um, playing rips, you know, using infuse with this on rips, putting that up against Kaleidoscape and all of that. I think this is just like kind of the re real cool embodiment of home theater tinkering uh, in that. And may maybe it doesn't do, maybe it doesn't deliver, maybe it does. Um, but this is something that, I, that I, I struck me as just incredibly like ingenious. Um, and the video again that they have that they link out to showing him like kind of taking apart the Apple TV device itself and how like the, the RF shielding is and how the, the board is printed in the traces and the chips and all that. Um, and, you know, kind of what he did to arrive at, at this mod. The only downside is I did exchange in the context of um, uh, talking with them in emails. I, I've I only exchanged a couple so far. One of my immediate thoughts or questions was like, well, do the 2022 model. I want you to mod a 2022 model. And their, their unfortunate take is that the 2021 model is better suited for this type of a, of a mod than the 2022 because I'm sorry. Yeah. The 2021 is better than the 2022 because the 2022 has kind of been cheapened in a way, unfortunately it's thinner, it's lighter. Sorry. I got to adjust my seating position here a little bit. It's thinner. It's lighter. It doesn't quite have the same shielding. It, it doesn't quite have, it doesn't have the fan. It doesn't have some of the same build quality, but in my opinion, like if you're going to make a device like this, you're going to tweak it up. You're going to mod it up you're going to make it available and you want to do that in an ongoing way. You, you gotta, you gotta support the new models kind of as, as they come along, you know, to the best of your ability. But so my other thought was even still, we, we game on our Apple TV, we use it for the other things. If this thing really is what it says it could be or what it could be promised to be, um, I could see one of these living in the theater for the large screen, you know, critical, uh, movie viewing, um, even if it is not the latest uh, Apple TV version, uh, you know, it's, it, it's it's OK in the theater just for video watching. And then I would just keep the 2022 model in the living room um, and then I wouldn't even load games in, in anything like that um, on this one. Or who knows, they're cheap enough for, to have the other one, maybe just have both Apple TVs. Um, in the theater, if I really wanted to, to game on one or use it for other stuff, you could have a $150 one sitting next to the X and just use the X for movie playback. So yeah, if you want to help out, you want to help the channel, you want to see this thing, send these guys, um, send these guys an email and let them know like, oh, you'd love to see tech enthusiasm, uh, review this thing. They're aware of me and I'm hoping, I'm hoping to talk to them on Friday and get my hands on one of these. But I, th I thought it was pretty pretty killer, um, pretty neat idea. So they, they've got some information in here, um, like O-scope traces and things kind of showing noise levels and all of that, um, and li links out to their, their videos, but that they give a lot of props to the engineering of this Apple TV, which I would expect from Apple, uh, you know, packing a lot of quality hardware engineering uh, into their devices and, and stuff. And then they, you know, built out this big old, <laughs> big old linear power supply. So based and they they link out as well to some other reviews and a um, couple other YouTube videos about the thing. But yeah, super intrigued. So we'll see what happens with that. But that's uh, that's something very, very squarely on my radar here at the moment.
Uh, Julius asked, does a Christie need to be calibrated? Um, yes, I think even like the Christie webpage talks about um, compatible with Christie Mystique, automated camera-based alignment solution. So a projector of that caliber needs <laughs> needs some hands-on love, I think, to, to maximize it. And um, Art had folks there for his meetup um, that were, you know, the resellers, the experts in doing all that stuff. Uh, Frankie Kent, great to see you're doing lives. Yeah, so I, I really want to do more of these. Um, just a matter of kind of figuring out the what, when, where, and how of it. Um, make make good topics. About an hour, 40 minutes, and I've been able to keep talking, and the questions have, have kept kept rolling in. So we'll go a little bit longer here. Um, but yeah, I, I would I would love to do more. Do, do more of these as well. Problem is like everybody's doing the live stream. So you look at all the big home theaterish YouTube channels. Um, you know, every night of the week, Youth Man's got Sunday night, the Hi-Fi uh, or Daily Tech Hi-Fi uh, Monday night. And Andrew Robinson's on another night and um, Randy's on, on another time. So <laughs> got to pick my pick my moments in, in between. But I would also too look to not do these just by myself as well, but have, you know, have other Michigan enthusiast folks on here um, or you know, partner up with the growing, growing sphere of friends that I'm making um, around this whole home theater social media area. Yeah, so we'll see where they go. Yeah, can't wait to see the tours of the fellow Triad deployments. Yeah, Triad is awesome. Triad's like one of the unsung brands of home theater. My living room was all Triad before I I kind of pulled it out and and reintegrated the theater down here. Um, they don't get a whole lot of. Uh, they don't get as much talk, I think, around various forums and that just because it's it's more of an integrated speaker solution. Really great speakers, really excellent for what they are. Um, doesn't quite have the flair <clears throat> of uh, of some other brands, but I know a ton of really nice, well done high end theaters that are triad based. And I still have some triad in the house as well. My subs in the living room are triad bronze in walls. Um, Andrew Stiegelmeyer says, Control 4 videos are welcome. Looking at Digital Mail Controller. Yeah, of all the stuff that I've talked about, I would say over the last year, you know, year plus due in the channel, um, automation, Control 4 is probably a little underrepresented in my content. And so... Um, I'd look to do a little bit more on that. I haven't, it's been asked for, and I haven't done like kind of a whole house automation tour talking about how, you know, how and what um, I've employed automation in the house. And I'll put my, my, what I would say, my normal brand of honesty on it, meaning that my automation um, uh, journey is not always been excellent. Um, in some ways, I think I overinvested in automation uh, I thought maybe it was a little cooler than the reality of of some of the things that it does. Um, and, you know, it doesn't, like automation is one of those things that when it doesn't work, it's a total pain in the butt. For example, you know, like I've got my garage doors on the automation and making sure your garage door is closed when you're away is a real important aspect of just general home security and you know, I've had experiences where that, that hasn't always been the case. So yeah, I'll, I, I do plan to talk more about control for some of the pros and cons and um, things I like and some of the shortcomings that I've experienced. Um, as mentioned, I'm, I'm pretty much in for the long haul with control for um, it's so tied in to the intelligence of my house that it wouldn't make sense to even try to consider another option at this point. Um, and I do want my halos. We'll see. Just hope they're priced right. Uh, SW, SRW1000 says URC remotes are nice. They restrict the software to custom installers now. Yeah, yeah. Control, control is a is a tough thing in um, in home theater with uh, Harmony going out and you know what all of our options and and stuff like that are. So. So we're still holding strong. We got 24 people. We peaked up around 30. A lot of folks here, but the the trickle in of questions has slowed down. We're at about an hour and 45 minutes. Um, 
I'd say maybe if uh, if we've got more questions, I'm happy to answer a couple more things. So let's make a little bit of a last call. Um, I'd say I, I hit a couple of the main main items that I want to talk about tonight. We, we got we touched on those meetups, talked about that Christie, talked about that Apple TVX. Um, Derek says hi. Hey Derek, hi finest three four three. Use AVR crossover or on full range and use sub crossover. Um, in my systems, I trust the processor to do the crossing over. So yeah, turn turn the sub up to its its maximum setting. Nullify, you know, most of that um, most of the settings in the subwoofer itself, and and I stick to stick to my processors. I let Arc Genesis make those decisions for me, uh, both for the um, the ABM 70 in the theater and the STR, uh, in the living room. So 38 special for every late arrival here. Just woke up. Um, good morning. Yeah. Well, you can rewind. You got an hour and 45 minutes of, uh, content to catch up on there. Glad to have you though. Paul Smother says, you talked about noise floor. Where is yours currently and what's the goal? Well, let's do this. So I have an app right here that I was playing with on my phone called the Decibel X. There you go. Sitting in silence. What were we looking at? 30s? mid to upper 30s. So I would say I don't have a good reference actually for what should be good. Um, and in some ways it's like it's more that the hiss of the speakers in the quiet room that I want to get rid of. And, and yep, there you go. I don't know if it's a ground loop. You know, I don't know what it is, um, but hums and buzzes and all that stuff. Uh, it drives me nuts, even though I, I can hear it. Um, you know, certainly when content is playing and stuff like that, but, uh, I'm an engineer, I'm a nerdy engineer and, and I want that, I want that noise gone. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to work on a few things to do it again. I've got those PS audio noise harvesters. <laughs> we'll see, see about those. Um, the Furman didn't do it for me. So, um, I might try some other power cables coming up, um, I don't know, maybe trying to tie some of the equipment uh, to ground. I, I really need somebody that's like an expert in kind of the electrical side of things. If I knew somebody to come over and help me out or maybe stumble across another another enthusiast at one of these meetups, you know, in, in, in Michigan here, that's like a, an electrician, um, expert, whatever that, uh, you know, that could, that could help me with it. But we'll see. Whatever, whatever, whatever epiphanies I, I find... Um, I will absolutely cover and share them. And I've, I've had some other real more severe instances of buzz in my system as well. When I had the Kaleidoscape Strato S actually, um, I could hear the hard drive of the Strato in my speakers as it, as it wound up and, and did things, um, moving to the, uh, splitting the unit out to having the C and the compact Terra it eliminated all of that. So that wasn't a concern. Um, took that one out, but the PC has been another thorn in the side of my home theater uh, many times off and on. Um, I've got my PC running on a Humex uh, uh, ground uh, lift adapter, basically, right now, because uh, historically, if I take that computer and I plug it in, as soon as the GPU spools up, uh, you play a game, you get any kind of GPU load, man, it's like <clears throat> coming out of, of everything. Um, Humex, Humex cut that out, thankfully, but I mean, uh, it's such a pain. Like you shouldn't have to do all this stuff, all, all this, all these electronics, all these things should just be noise quiet. Um, so if anybody going back to the idea of noise floor, you know, may, maybe I'm better, maybe I'm better off than I, than I know I am. Um, if anybody else knows, knows the noise floor in your rooms, uh, post them curious to curious to see maybe 35 or 
isn't all that bad. My big, one of my bigger problems too, um, in my room is that over here on the back of the room here on the other side of that wall is my utility uh, room of the house. Hot water heaters in there, our geothermal uh, unit is in there and a soffit soffit that runs kind of above my, almost above my head in the back here where I'm sitting um, is where our geo uh, pipe tubes are, right? So the, the pump pumps the fluid out and then it returns in and it does its underground geothermal stuff. And when heat and AC is running, you can hear the thing running in the room adjacent. You can hear some rush of, of stuff there. That's what I get for not designing the theater uh, into the house from the very beginning. Um, if I could have done that, I would have, I would have, you know, would have avoided all of this. But in that future home theater 3040 variant that I was talking about, we'll get this room flipped around. We'll sit further away on the other side of the room from where this stuff is. And I would have a new opportunity to rip this drywall down, backfill, noise, abate, reduce all of that stuff, uh, treat the utility room, mechanical room to the nines over there and quiet all that stuff up uh, to a much larger degree. Um, let's see what happens. Luckily, none of, uh, you know, it's first world problems here. I'm not, um, none of it's really that bad. Um, and as soon as we got a movie playing at any decent volume, it, it's, it's enough to, to, to beat it all. So it's, it's, it's definitely a want uh, and I would say a, a personal challenge, an engineering challenge, than a, than a need. But 38 special forever. 3 a.m. there. My gosh, man, I hope you're not working tomorrow. I can't stay up that late anymore. Kind of getting older. Somebody has a birthday tomorrow. Somebody on the Techthusiasm channel. One year one year older. Um, I used to be able to to stay up, stay up into those hours and do whatever, playing games, get up for work the next day. Not anymore. My ability to do that stuff went away with my with my hair. Uh, Oprah Winfrey says, I also have Arundel 2Vs. Yeah, mine are two S's, but man, great subs. Um, the Arundel makes really nice stuff, really well-built stuff. There's another guy local here too, Brian. Um who I think we'll, I'll, I'll be collaborating with as well. He actually has a, a channel where he talks about some of his home theater things. He's bought into a bunch of Arundel sound uh, speakers, 1723 speakers and stuff. He's really loving them. <clears throat> yeah, Hi-Fi is three, 343. Thoughts on eliminating ground loops? I, I wish I knew. <laughs> if I knew how, I would do it and I would share it. I'd scream it to the world, but I'll, I'm something I'm going to be working on here, figuring out. <clears throat> Both my systems zone two speakers have a 60 hertz home. Yeah. Oh, it's, that's like the worst one um, amongst like some of the worst things I think that we can experience in this hobby is stuff like that, right? Where you've got all this, you got all this high end stuff, all this premium gear. It's all hooked up, you know, painstakingly selected and, and managed and, and, and all put together by us. And, uh, and then you get something like that and it just, it blows, blows the enjoyment. Brings the enjoyment factor down significantly. Um, Andrew Stiegelmeyer, had no idea you're a Michigan man. Yep, Southeast Michigan. Um, hello from Indy. Cool. Do a Midwest HT group going. So um, I, I started off talking about it at the, at the beginning of the live stream, but um, ABS Forum uh, in certain areas of ABS Forum is an excellent, excellent place to go to find other folks in the hobby. And interestingly is too, uh, one of the other things I was thinking to do on a live stream, there was a little while back, a couple months ago, I put up like a, a sprint series of polls asking a bunch of questions. And I collected some really interesting answers to some of those. And I think maybe, maybe in a future live stream, I'll pull them all up and we'll kind of just look at these Q and A's, get an idea um, uh, of where a lot of the, the, the audience sits in, in the, the community sits. Uh, but one of the questions I ask is like, do you, how do you use your theater room? Do you use it by yourself, like with a spouse, with a family or with friends? And um, I don't remember what the numbers specifically were offhand, but it was overwhelmingly the majority by myself. And uh, 
it's and, and even in getting out and meeting people in the hobby, you know, the story like almost universally is, you know, yeah, I, I kind of do this stuff by myself. And so it's really cool to meet some people that are into it. Like I am just repeated over and over again. That was my story, you know, my story as well. So anyway, the long story short of that, um, uh, you know, find, find the communities, ABS forum, uh, there's meetup communities. The Michigan group is really starting to, to establish itself a bit. Um, so if you want to make a drive up from, from, um, Indiana there, um, we've got a, we've got stuff going on. We had a home theater meetup trifecta weekend, uh, last weekend, we've got a speaker shootout coming up and m more guys are going to be posting. I think uh, more folks are going to be posting, hosting events and, and meetups and all that. And I'll be doing some too. Um, question, what if you unplug the cables between the anthem and parasound, do you still have the noise? Um, I, I need to go like systematically back across the things that I've tried to eliminate the noise, but I, suffice to say, I've done a lot of disconnecting and reconnecting and, um, nothing that led me to any conclusive evidence or, uh, root cause, I guess yet. So I need, I need to kind of start all that over, especially now that I've, all my, all these upgrades are done. Everything's kind of connected. I'm at a pretty good stasis point here. We'll get after it. So cool. A couple people post in Paul Smother says my room is low 40 DB. No noise except for a somewhat large hard drive and a NAS. And Derek says 36 DB. So we're all kind of in the same similar range there. Um, yeah, I guess, I mean, you don't want to live uh, or, or do this hobby in an anechoic chamber. Right. But um yeah, I'll be doing some more research on this. What what is a good what is a good target noise floor to try to try to achieve? Um, Eight seventy six open room says, "Do you use a mini DSP with your two subs?" No, I do not use a mini DSP. Um, I just haven't had an. I don't think I've had a felt I've had a reason to. Um, I have two subs: the Anthem, uh, two subs in the theater actually, and two subs in the living room. Both of the Anthem AVM seventy and the STR um, support independent. Uh, complete uh, calibration equalization um, of two subwoofers and so in my setup right now I don't think there's anything really that a mini DSP could do for me that I'm not already happy enough with from Anthem's processing now if I did add more subs I went to four then I got a choice to make I could I could go ahead and run them in pairs and just still stick uh, stick with the Anthem uh, I could go to the 90 which I would probably prefer to do, uh, but that's a three thousand dollar or or more decision, um, you know, or or bring in something like the Mini DSP. But I I don't know. I, I like to try to keep things simpler. One of the things that you see me talk about a lot on the channel is just you know being being measured, intentional, deliberate, trying to keep a bit of a of an air of a mindset towards just keeping keeping things simpler. And to me, mini DSP isn't, isn't keeping things, uh, keeping things simple, but we'll see. Um, Henley Garcia, have you gotten an update for your LG issue? No. So, um, I alluded to this, I think a little bit earlier, I still have some turn on command and control problems. It seems to be limited now that I can't just like, uh, have control for turn on the LG and command it to a specific input. So my process, whenever I turn the TV on and I try to tell the family, this is, you only ever turn the TV on to the Apple TV. And if you want to use something else, they want to play the switch or the PC or something, turn it on the Apple TV first, make sure it's on the Apple TV there. Everything is good. Then flip, you know, use control four to command to go to a different source or a different input. Um, and then when you shut it off, never shut it off. Not on the Apple TV. There's something magic about and i don't have cec turned on none of that stuff but still there's something magic about the the apple tv connection input um to the lg that makes it stable in a way that other inputs and other uh switching uh command uh isn't so wild i i hope i hope lg you know gets their gets their firmware folks cranking 
and fix it up. I've been happy with the uh, the amount of updates, frequency of updates that have started to flow out to the TV. So they need to they need to keep it up. Uh, Hi Finest three four three. Do you think the new Apple TV will solve the Atmos Netflix Net, Atmos Netflix issue? Yeah, I don't know. I would guess that that's probably more of a software problem than a hardware problem. Um, I know I've seen a variety of folks uh, mention this, and for as much as I use our Apple TV and we do watch stuff on Netflix, I've only had it happen one time. Um, we were watching, um, we were watching a show and the audio was dropping out. Just force closed the app, and I don't remember actually if I did a full reset restart of the apple not a reset but a restart of the apple tv so it's not something that i've seen prevalent um in my setups thankfully uh 38 special forever the nice thing about direct live base control in arc genesis they do automatic sub phase integration yeah game changer yep again I, I love it um get a get a piece of hardware and software and a platform that you trust and let it do its thing. And if you like the results, enjoy them, enjoy them with peace of mind. That's what I try to do. And I, I can say that I've been happy with the, the, the results out of Anthem, you know, in that, in that regard. So, all right. So we just broke two hours. I think, I think it's time. I think it's time. Got a big day tomorrow. Big birthday tomorrow. And uh, awesome content coming. Um, just some tea. Might as well throw some teasers out. So Friday, I've been I've been pushing on these streaming technical challenge face-offs. I did the Amazon shows last weekend. Uh, I think Friday's video will be Netflix. Uh, and then I've already got an Apple TV Plus um streaming measurement technical uh video done uh, edited ready to go um if you want to see videos early you know i did put up those youtube memberships and i, and I can share some content early to members got one member so far small steps <laughs> um but yeah so th those are coming and i and i want to do hbo max uh, exclusive content i want to do disney plus exclusive content paramount plus peak you know peacock cover them all um i've got Kevin's Formosa home cinema tour video coming on Monday and then going, going into more content, um, going into more content from there. Got a lot of stuff to tinker with. <laughs> Happy birthday. Yeah. Thanks so much guys. I really appreciate it. That's kind of why I wanted to make sure to get it in today. So tomorrow is going to be family, family night. I'm hoping for a lot of Marvel champions, Marvel champions gifts. Um, it's not tech enthusiastic, but one of the things that we've been playing a lot in our household has been uh, Marvel Champions card game. Awesome, awesome card game. My son and I are in the middle of one right now. I'm playing Thor, and um, he's playing Spider-Man against the, the Green Goblin villain uh, pack that came out. Really cool game. <laughs> yep. Oh, Kosh. Hey, Kosh. How's it going? Yeah, 4.3 subs. Yep, I'm hoping... Hoping to see maybe 5K. I think there's a chance we could see 5K in November. That'd be an awesome birthday month, birthday month present, and then keep flying from there. Uh, do you have a link to your YouTube friend that got the Arundel system? Um, let me plug Brian's channel. Give me one second here. And I can pull this link. I almost asked Brian if he wanted to get on the stream tonight. There we go. All right, I'll put this one in the chat. Hopefully that comes through as a link. It's called Hi-Fi Home Theater. Um, he did some. He doesn't have too many videos up yet. Um, He's been talking about his Denon 3800H lately. But if you want to hear him say more about those Arundel speakers, um, pop over to his channel and, and ask. I'm sure I'm sure he'll uh, be obliged to make some content about those. 
Yeah, he's another Michigan guy. He lives just yeah, probably only 15 minutes from me. All right, I think we are. I think we're there. I think we're time. So, um, again, thanks so much, everybody. This has been awesome fun. I think we peaked out in the 30s for a live stream on a small channel. I think that's that's doing great. I, I just so enamored with the response that the channel has gotten. I appreciate every every single you know view, like, uh, subscription, share, uh, and all that stuff. Um, having so much fun doing this. And we're going to keep going. Um, I will definitely get into more of these live streams, get some special guests going, and um, try to get them on something more of a regular regular cadence as well. So look for details on that to come. Otherwise, thanks so much. Please do all the regular YouTube stuff. And come on back for more home theater discussion and fun. Thanks.